Carbon capture and storage is probably the easiest way to imagine if you think of a power station like Ratcliffe on Saw, which has a, a chimney stack out the top of it, which produces um, carbon dioxide um, in a mixture of basically other gases from, from the combustion of coal. What, what you're trying to do with carbon capture is take the CO2 or the carbon dioxide out of that chimney stack and stop it going into the atmosphere. So with carbon capture, it's almost you put a, a, a unit on the back of it, which is, I mean, in terms of the, the actual capture itself for carbon capture, it's a gas separation. So what you're trying to do, if you think of your coal fire at home, um, you'll burn coal in it, if you have a coal fire at home, of course, um, and you'll mix air into it, I have, uh, and as a result, you'll end up with carbon dioxide, water and nitrogen coming off in terms of the flue gas that, that goes up your chimney. So the actual capture technologies will separate the nitrogen from the CO2 and produce a fairly pure stream of CO2. The, the next stages you have to deal with is really compressing that CO2 and then transporting it to a, to a storage site. So in terms of storage site, there's various technologies you can use. So a lot of the ideas is trying to reverse what you would imagine for the North Sea in a way. So there's been um, North Sea gas fields and North, North Sea oil fields where there's been uh, gases and liquids stored under the North Sea for long periods of time. Now, obviously, people have been searching in there and drilling holes into it, into these geological storage reservoirs and extracting the oil and the gas from it. In terms of carbon storage or geological storage of your CO2, you're, you're reversing that process. So you're putting the CO2 back underground again into something that's geological sta geologically stable. And I mean, importantly, if you think of the gas traps, they've been there for hundreds of thousands or millions of years before anyway. So the theory is you can put the CO2 back in there again and it's going to be stable and survive for a long period of time. You've got a very large volume of gas. If you think of the, the tons of coal that are burnt in the power station per day, um, there's a huge flow of gas coming through. And, if you think of gases as well, it's not very simple. You can't just pluck them out of the air and separate them and put them in bags. You need to, you need to play on the properties of the different gases you've got. So uh, you need some kind of chemical cleaning technology or um, solvent really to separate the different gases and extract them. And in terms of the whole chain of carbon capture and storage, it is really the most expensive step that you've got in the process as well. Um, it's the most energy intensive step. So you've, the, the current technology of choice is using um, solvent system, amine solvent system. So you get a reaction with the CO2 and this amine. Um, and then you really, you have kind of moving, pumping liquids around in different capture regeneration beds. But your, your regeneration, you have to heat this solvent again as well to, to drive off the pure CO2 gas. So it is quite a complex energy intensive process. There's talk of possibly the worst extreme is um, taking about 10 percentage points off the efficiency of a power station. So if you built a modern power station now, all the energy from the coal, you would turn about 50% of that energy into electricity. If you put carbon capture on, you reduce that to about 40%. So it's quite a large hit on your, on your efficiency. So a lot of research and a lot of people, you know, the dream in a way is trying to get the um, efficiency penalty that much lower. So developing much more efficient processes. So instead of using liquid solvents, I'll use um, solvents such as monoethanoamine, which is a, a, an amine liquid. We've started developing um, solid materials that, that act in the same way to separate the CO2 and nitrogen. And we're also looking at developing the processes for these and how you can integrate these into power stations as well. Uh, in terms of the materials, they, we, we changed the chemistry of the surface. So we'll get a very porous material, something that can have, for example, about a thousand meters squared per gram in terms of surface area. So very high, high surface area materials. And we, we try and put functional groups on the surface that reacts with the CO2. So it's almost, in some ways, if you think of catalysts, you have a very porous material that's got reactive sites. You try and do that, the same material, same of a material for capturing CO2 as well. I mean, I guess the largest project we have is uh, an EON EPSRC funding project, so an Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. Um, in that program, we've had, there's four universities, so there's Birmingham, U University College London, Liverpool and Nottingham. We're all, we've all got different expertise, so there's two chemistry departments and there's two chemical engineering departments in there. And the chemistry departments have got a lot of focus on making materials for, for this capture process that, that the right, you know, have the right um, performance and the right capacity. And work at Nottingham and work at Birmingham, we're, we're much more interested in testing these materials as well and seeing how they perform in real life gases. So you, you have a flue gas, which is actually can be, it's a fairly hot gas, it's got oxygen in there, it's got moisture. And a lot of materials start to break down and degrade in that. So what we try to do is test the materials in a, in a realistic environment as possible. So we're, we're in the process of still not on the ground yet, but building a rig 
where we have um, actual flue gas that we can run through and actually test the materials and see how much CO2 they uptake.